A great discussion with Jordan Banks. I learned a lot there. I'm not a user of social media for all kinds of reasons. I find people end up putting their foot in their mouth, and I'm pretty good at that stuff. But it certainly does dominate our world. And I, I know I do uh, check my, uh, my device probably more than I would uh, give myself credit for most of the time. Um, you give me too much credit here. No one person creates anything in the world that I was in with the Olympics. It was very much you own the podium and what we accomplished there was a collaborative, uh, collaborative effort that involved many, many people. And I had the very good fortune to be uh, present at the time and to be part of the process of creating something that I think changed our country forever in many ways, and I'll talk about that. Um, I must say there's a certain degree of trepidation I have coming up here talking about something like on the podium, which was very much around winning, etc. And the word winning right now is somewhat denigrated by the simplistic musings of a somewhat vainglorious and self-aggrandizing buffoon running for office in a neighboring constituency right now. So <laughs> you have to be careful about how we talk about some of these things. Um, I want to talk about how we created what we did with On the Podium, and not so much the mechanics of it, but what happened philosophically to bring us to the point where Canadians were able to embrace something the way we did. And uh, I'm going to start off allegorically here with a little story. So in the words of my favorite uh, television uh, interviewer that I watch religiously every Sunday, uh, Fried Zakaria, uh, let's get started. One day there was a cab driver and a priest who died, and they went to heaven. And they showed up at the pearly gates, and uh, St. Peter came down, and he said, God will be down to uh, meet you in a few minutes. And introduce you to this wonderful world that you've uh, joined. He said, in the meantime, come with me to the vestibule next door, and I'm going to give you the garments on which you will be draped in perpetuity. So they go into the next room, and St. Peter goes into the closet, and he comes out and to, goes over to the cab driver, and he, he clothes him in this beautiful white silk gown with gold sash, gold embroidery, little gold wreath on his head and everything. Quite something. And the priest looks and says, geez, imagine what's going to happen to me. I've served God my entire life. And he comes out to the, uh, the priest and gives him this tattered garment that was little more than maybe a torn burlap bag. And the priest is somewhat uh, dismayed, and he's going to say something. And he says, the Lord will be down to meet you in a minute. You can ask him any questions you have. So they go to the next room, and God comes down, and he's about to address them. And the priest says, excuse me, your holiness, may I say a few words? He says, go ahead, my son. He said, you know, my entire life, he said, I have served you well. I have taught the gospel. I've created wonderful uh, sermons for my parish every Sunday. I've worked in the community. And I find myself standing before you somewhat sartorially diminished. I said, here's this mere cab driver has this beautiful gown, and I'm wearing this tattered robe. He says, I don't understand. And God looks at him, and he says, you know, I watched every one of your sermons, I watched your work in the community, and you certainly served me well, and you did understand God's word, he said. But I watched those sermons, and by and large, every week, when you preached, your parish basically fell asleep. But you know, when this man drove a taxi, everybody prayed. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, results matter. They matter to you and your business. If you're not raising the money, you're not doing the job. You've got to set goals and objectives. And that, at the end of the day, struck me very much in my face when I joined the Olympic Committee after having uh, left uh, the, the, the business world with Quebec Or. And uh, I joined in the early 2003, just as we were in the middle of the process of bidding for the Games in Vancouver. And the vote was going to take place in July in Prague, Prague that year. And there's a lot of talk about, you know, what were we doing and, and, uh, and, and what the athletes needed and all of these kinds of things. And, uh, and so as we started to move forward and we, we won the bid in, in Prague, one of the things that became very evident right away was that if the team wasn't successful, the game wouldn't be seen to be successful in Vancouver. You know, we had the ignominious glory in Canada of having hosted two Olympic games in 76 and 88. And in those games, we did not win one gold medal in either one. No country in the history of the world had ever hosted an Olympic games and not won a gold medal on home soil. And we were so good at being bad, we did it twice. 
you know. So there was a lot of talk about what are we going to do to change this. And one of the people that became very close to me in this process was my uh, colleague, the late Mark Lowry, who was our vice president of sport and games at the time. Probably one of the most wonderful people I ever met and a man who was truly, I think, the greatest friend that our amateur athletes ever had. He was a true inspiration to work with and to be part of a team that involved him. And, and we started talking about what we were gonna do to change this. In the meantime, we were moving forward and the games were coming up in Athens. And then this is a very important part of the genesis of what created on the podium. We went to Athens and the team didn't do well. We won 12 medals. It was perceived that we should do better. We were down considerably from what we'd done in the past, and it's hard at the Summer Olympics, but there was a lot of discussion about why we weren't doing well. And I sat on the dais at the end of the games with a number of my colleagues, Mike Chambers, who was our president at the time, my colleague Mark, a number of others, answering questions from the media. And amongst them, there was one question that came and struck me in the face like a bowl out of heaven through my heart. And it was from Dave Perkins, and Richard Petty would know Dave Perkins. I'm sure that uh, you got a few good uh, questions from him in, in your tenure with the Leafs. And Perky could really hit the nail on the head. You know, and we were talking about the fact that other countries had more money, and we weren't getting the funding that we needed, and on and on and on. And Perkins had his hand up, and it was his question. He says, Chris, I hear what you're saying, and I understand all that. He says, but what are you going to do about it? right in the heart. What are you going to do about it? You know, and we left that meeting and I turned to Mark and I said, you know something, Mark? I'm never ever going to sit up on a podium again and have a guy ask me a question like that and I don't have an answer. I said, you know something? We have abdicated our responsibility to lead. We're making all kinds of excuses for failure. But the fact is, we're the Canadian Olympic Committee. We have the resources, we have the brand, we have the ability to go and find for our athletes the resources that they need and create the programs they need to be successful. Because we're finding all kinds of reasons that they weren't. We worried that we're putting too much pressure on the athletes. We're worried that we're too focused on winning and so on and so forth, you know. There was too much talk in our country about, well, these are the best we have and being on the Olympic team is fantastic and you should be proud to be there and we're all very proud of you. Well, that's very nice. But the Olympics are the best of the best in the world. And the fact of the matter is, if you ask any Canadian, any Canadian kid, and I can tell you, you will never have met, you will not meet now, nor will you ever meet a young Canadian athlete who's 11 or 12 or 13 years old and wants to go to the Olympics, who goes to bed at night and dreams about finishing 12th, listening to the German national anthem being played. You know? <laughs> they want to win, and we were not giving them the help and the tools and the guidance that they needed. So we decided to move forward from that point, and you know, and we got back to uh, to our offices in Toronto and Ottawa. And I sat down with Mark, and I said, I said, you know, what do we do about this? You know, let's think about how we can come up with a plan because no one person creates anything. It has to be a collaborative effort. There has to be a shared vision of values. There has to be an articulated mission. Everybody has to buy into it and understand what their role is. And Mark came back to me in about a month and he said, you know, Chris, I've got an idea. He said, uh, I think first of all, I want to hire Kathy Priestner, one of our famous uh, speed skaters and a very bright lady, and do an analysis of the situation we're in with our winter sports. You know, it's like anything in business. If you've run a business, you don't know where you're going to go if you don't know where you are. You've got to understand what your business is about, who you're competing with, what's your point of differentiation, where are we, so that if I'm going to go forward, I know what my baseline is. And we didn't know our baseline. I said, well, what have you got in mind? He says, I want to hire her to do an assessment of our winter sports, its strengths and weaknesses, et cetera. And, uh, and then we'll take that information, we'll share it with the winter sports and decide where we go from there. I said, great, how much do you think it'll cost? He said, about 150 grand. I said, go ahead, I'll get the money. And uh, we got some money from the COC, the Paralympic Committee, the uh, federal government, Sport Canada, put in some money. CODA, who managed the facilities in Calgary, where most of our uh, winter sports train. And uh, John Furlong and the organizing committee in Vancouver put in some money. So we got the 150 grand. And uh, we talked to Kathy about creating a program. And the next step, and this is where it really comes together, the next step was to go to all of the winter sports, all 13 of them, because at the end of the day, they're the ones that developed and created the athletes. So this is what we would like to do to help you out. We said, we're going to do a survey 
of, of, our, uh, of our winter sports. Look at the gap analysis. Where are we strong? Where are we weak? What can we possibly do to be successful? What resources do we need? And on and on. And had a conversation with them. And uh, subsequently, about a week later, I, I get a, a letter from their leader saying, you know, um, we're the ones that control winter sports, not the COC. Uh, you're, you're infringing on our territory. There's a lot of turf protection in that world. You know, there's, uh, the intoxication of power is huge, and you've seen some of the things that go wrong. FIFA and other constituencies where power has uh, distorted the values of many of these organizations. So they sent me a letter and said, you know, this is not really your province. Uh, I said, that's fine. I said, we don't want to run your sports, and I don't intend to. But what I do intend to do is to do the survey, get the information, and I'll give it to you, and you can decide what you're going to do with it. Well, then they came back and said, well, if you're going to do it anyway, we have to be part of it. And that's when the penny dropped. Then it became everybody's project. All of the leaders of all the winter sports, of Sport Canada, of Vanock, our sponsors, everybody had a piece of the pie. They had a piece of the action and they had a piece of creating a vision for success that we'd never had in sport in this country leading up to that point. So we did the survey and we gave the information to the winter sports. We said, take it away and come back to us and tell us what you think you can do if we got you all the resources you wanted. Well, there were a couple of things that came out of the survey that were really important. The first one, and probably the most important, was that we, were, we did not have what we call a great conversion rate. Now, by conversion rate in that world, what we meant was that in a games, or in winter sport, uh, world championships and world cups, in the year leading up to the Olympic games, we felt that any athlete that finished uh, in the top five had the potential to convert and get a medal at the games. If they'd done it twice in the year before, they should have been, we should have been able to get some of them, a certain percentage on the podium. And we took a look at how we did in our previous games in Salt Lake City, where we finished tied for fourth, and I think we had 17 medals. Well, it turned out that those games, we were converting our athletes at a rate of 27%. 27% of those that had finished in the, uh, in the top five, twice the year before games, ended up getting a medal. Well, the other top five countries around us, Austria, Germany, the United States, Norway, Switzerland, they were converting at an average or combined rate of 65%. The Germans at 94%. Now, you don't have to know a hell of a lot about sport or be a genius to recognize that our athletes were not well prepared going into the stress of the big day. They either didn't believe in themselves or they didn't have the, the resources or they didn't have the right attitude or we weren't supporting them the right way and on and on and on and on. We said, we have to find a way to address this. The second is we found we just didn't have enough athletes in the pipeline. We call it depth of field. And we didn't have a lot of time to change that because it takes about eight years to develop a high performance athlete. You get the odd exception like this kid, Andre DeGrasse, that's a runner for us now who just, just came out of nowhere. He's, he's, he's a gift from God. You know, and he's got a, a tremendous gift and he's going to be a, a real talent. But most of the time, it takes about eight years from the time you've got a, a really good athlete to get him to the point where at the end of the day, you know, in, in the Olympics, you're measuring uh, first place to, to 15th place in a ski race by less than one second in a race that takes two minutes. I mean, that's how finely tuned these people have to be. You're spending millions of dollars to buy a hundredth of a second. So there's a lot of work that has to be done to get to the point where they, they can do that. So we started to address that particular point, and we, we, we gave the information to the sports. We said, go away and tell us what resources do you need, and what do you think you could do if we got you those resources? And they came back in a month or so, and they said, and this was the astonishing thing, and this was their idea. We didn't set the bar high. It was the sports idea. And they had the information, the analysis, and they sat down, and they came back, and they said, if you can get us an extra $110 million for the next five years, we think we can be number one in medals at the games in Vancouver. My God, what an audacious statement for Canadians to make. We don't do that, Americans do that. 
And we put that out there, we listened to them, and we looked at the analysis, and they were right. If we could get them the resources, there was the chance that we could get there. We were aspirational, and we dreamt high, and we set the bar high, but it was based on an understanding of where we are and what the realities of getting there would be. So we went to the uh, Canadian government. We got $55 million from them when we told our story. And we went to the sponsors. John Furlong was fantastic in this. Brought the sponsors on board from Van Ock. We got $55 million from them. And it was based on a business plan. Here's where we are. Here's where we're going to go. Here's where, how we're going to get there. Here's everybody's role. Here's how we're going to measure you. Here's the feedback you're going to get. And on and on and on. And we started to invest in what we had to do be, to be successful, and we set out a plan on how we were going to measure ourselves on the way through. Uh, about a year later, we hired Roger Jackson to come back and manage the program. He's a brilliant guy, been around sport for a long time, and everybody was involved in the process. There were many leaders, you know, and, and uh, Sir Isaac Newton said about leadership, if I see further than others, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. Well, there were a lot of giants here. And the leadership involved not only those who took charge of doing things, but the leadership also involved those, the ones who got into the analysis, who knew they would get nothing because we were also going to target our funds. We weren't going to be a mile wide and an inch deep. You know, that's how you end up getting a lot of seventh place finishes. We were going to put the money behind those that had a chance to be successful. And we were going to get them the extra resources they needed. And that meant sports like... Uh, 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 modern pentathlon, or not modern pentathlon, but uh, biathlon and Nordic combined and ski jumping and others, they were going to get nothing. But those people bought into the program knowing that if we could create something great for the future, they would benefit in the future as we move forward. You know, sometimes leadership in life is not about being at the front. It might be be at the back saying, wait for me, I'm your leader. Or it might be choosing who to follow. Being able to follow and make that choice is also a good sign of leadership. And the people that led those sports recognized that, and they participated in the program in the same way. So we moved forward and we started to create things. The first thing we invested in was coaching. There's only one thing you can do, get better coaches. You all know from your business careers that there's nothing in life like a mentor. And a mentor is a coach. And we had to get better coaching. We simply didn't have it in our system. We had to get the money to travel and compete against the best on a regular basis. You have to fine tune your skills in, in that world by competing against those that are perceived to be better than you and raising your bar and knowing what the standard's going to be. We had to invest in technology to make sure that we were giving the best uh, sports medicine and sports science and equipment, etc., that we hadn't done in the past. We needed to create an attitude amongst their athletes that they knew that they had the best and that never again would they line up at the starting line at a race or at the top of a ski hill and look at the athlete beside them and have that self-doubt that says, you know, he's probably got a better coach than I have or they've got better technology than I have. We had to eradicate that self-doubt from their minds. And we created a thing called uh, our top secret program, which quite frankly was by and large a lot of smoke and mirrors. The reason it was top secret is because we really didn't have a hell of a lot there. But, <laughs> but we did have some stuff. We were going up with the National Research Council and using wind tunnels and we were creating new fabrics with our, our people and inventing different kinds of speed skates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there was some, but a lot of it was smoke and mirrors. But they didn't know that, and the rest of the world didn't know that. Saying, so what the hell is going on in Canada? And we started to measure ourselves by games as they came up. And we looked at how we were doing every year in World Cups. We went to Italy in Torino, and we set a bar there to see if we could perhaps finish third, and we set a target of around 24, 25 medals. Well, by God, we got 24 medals. Um, we were one short of coming second with 25, and ironically, it's because we didn't get a medal in hockey, believe it or not. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was the year we tanked and came second. It was a disaster. Um, but we kept moving up, and every single year, we knew we were on the right track because we were getting more and more finishes near the top in World Cups and World Championships. So we measured ourselves against the targets we'd set, and we were moving forward, and we knew we were on the right track. And we started to bring other athletes into the programs. 
But everybody was a part of that process as we went forward. And everybody was totally committed to it. You know, and you have to be committed to these programs. It's like the story of bacon and eggs. I'm sure you all eat bacon and eggs. You know, bacon and eggs, the chicken is involved, the pig is committed. You know, we wanted pigs. And we created a lot of pigs. And people were committed to the program. And it moved forward. And, you know, as when we started, we were excoriated in the media. I got called out by all kinds of people say, you've got out on a limb. You're putting too much pressure on the athletes. I said, no, we're not. We're not putting any pressure on the athletes. They put it on themselves. We are putting pressure on ourselves in the system to finally give to them the resources that they need and the support they need to realize the dreams and ambitions they have that they're so... They're so prepared to work hard to achieve. We were putting the pressure on ourselves to help them to, uh, to get the results they want and to deliver the support that they needed. And then on top of that, we created a new program inside the COC that prepared their heads for the games because there is nothing more intense in the crucible of sport than being inside the athlete's village at a games waiting for your event to come up. Being able to focus and concentrate because I said, we're talking about uh, hundreds of a second in terms of performance. And, you, and it's, not like, uh, it's not like the hockey and NHL uh, Stanley Cup. You get seven games to play and there's 23 guys and there's three periods and there's lots of shifts on the ice. And if you screw up one, you're gonna get back on the ice again. You got one race and that's it. You've got one match against somebody and that's it. No repeats, you know. You've got to be there in the moment. Preparing an athlete for that, that is that finely tuned, is very, very difficult. So we brought in those that had done it. We brought in Marty McBean and many others who had been there, who had demonstrated success, who understood how to handle the pressure, to sit down and counsel the kids inside the village. We removed distractions. We gave them media training on how to deal with the sort of the offside questions you can often get to media that can entrap a naive young athlete, et cetera, and throw off their game. Uh, we isolated them as best we could so that they were there in the moment when they had to compete. And it all came together the right way. You all know the story. When we got to the games, 14 gold medals. Who in the hell would have ever thought we'd done that? We didn't even set that bar that high. We set the bar for most medals, but we got 27, way more than we'd done. We came third in total medals. We would probably would have had more because we had so many athletes that were focused on what they wanted to do. This kid, Del Bosco, that was a, uh, was a, uh, 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 one of these uh, skiers, uh, border cross skier, whatever they call it. Um, you know, he got fourth. He could have passed the guy and gotten a bronze medal at the end, but then he kind of flamed out in the last. He, he said, I didn't come here to get a bronze. I came here to win. We had so many athletes that were so intensely focused on winning that we probably lost out on some of the other medals we got. But 14 gold medals, it, it was quite frankly beyond belief. I was sitting on the goal line there when Crosby scored that goal. I thought, holy shit, this is unbelievable. I said, you know, and I didn't know it was sudden death. I thought they, they were going to keep on playing, and I knew everybody jumping all over. I mean, and it, was, and it was a fluke shot. You know, it was a bad shot from the corner. I don't know how it got in, but that, that was the icing on the cake. And we won, we won the, the three of the big ones, and the, you know, the, the two curlings and the two golds. We had to do those because if you don't do those, Canadians feel you're not going to be successful. But what a games it was. But the legacy of it all is that we changed the way we think in Canada forever. The concept of own the podium became this audacious expression of our ability in Canada to set bold goals and objectives and be proud of trying to achieve beyond what we've done before. And it didn't mean that we had to affect a compromise in the wonderful values that we have in this country about sending good people to games or competing fairly and all of those things. The two concepts are not mutually exclusive and I could never understand why people would rationalize not wanting to win at games in, in an environment that is the best of the best in the world. And you go inside that athlete's village you know, and the most wonderful thing you could ever do in your life is to spend time in the cafeteria at the Athletes' Village. Because there you have 5,000 5, people at one time. There's 12,000 in, in the village. But you have 5,000 people there for lunch at one time, all sharing the same goal and objective to be the very best they could be and try and win amongst the peers of the entire world. And you have 206 countries there, all from diverse backgrounds, a diversity of religion, 
politics, economics, color, and everything else that is all set aside as all these wonderful young people share this one thing, this bond they have in common. And I've often said to people, you know, the Athletes Village cafeteria at an Olympics Games is a metaphor for what our better world could be if we could ever get our act together. So we're there and we got there and we changed what we are in this country forever in terms of our ability to set those kinds of goals. And it's carried on and I think it carries on in a society in many ways. I hope it does. I know that in the interceding years, I've talked many times to many business groups, but how can you make Own the Podium work in your company? And it's really quite simple because it was based on business principles. It was based on here's where we are, here's where we wanna go, Here's how we're gonna get there. Here's everybody's role. It's gotta be collaborative. You've gotta give a little bit to get a little bit. You've gotta have a sense of well-articulated vision to get there and then work hard to achieve that and not be ashamed to express that desire to be the best that you can possibly be. And that's the simple story of On the Podium. It was a collaborative effort amongst many wonderful people in this country to try and help our best people in sport achieve their dreams and goals and objectives. Thank you very much.